Hi, it's Ray from Pro Shaper in Charlton, and Mark says I don't smile enough, so. I'm back. So, we're going to do 10C on the aluminum hood today for the, uh, uh, the aluminum bonnet for the uh, E-Type Jag. And this was the panel we were working on. This was the panel that we previously worked on. And they're looking pretty good. All the gauges fit on them. The surfaces look pretty nice. And earlier today, I did do a preliminary trim on these both ends here, but they had to do the final trim on both of them. And on this one, I've got to tip this out of flange. I already did it on this one here. So, the first order of business, I think, is I'll trim this off. And we're going to trim it right to that line there. And um, the way that we generate those lines is we put the flexible shape pattern on there. And then we'll take a super fine pen and we'll draw the line. Now the flexible shape pattern can have a little bit of raggedness to the edge. So it, it, it depending on how you, you cut it when you, when you make it, uh, but it generally as you use it, it gets a little raggedy. So the line might wander a little tiny bit. So I use this 1 8 inch vinyl tape to idealize the line. You don't deviate much it could be only a matter of like twenty thousandths of an inch one way or another. So I generated that line and also this is the tip line here where that outer flange is going to go. And then I measured and using a divider marked it off here and I have where I'm going to tip this. So we're going to cut first. We'll do a precision cut with the cordless shear but we'll leave ourselves a little cheat room and we'll grind it in with a little air grinder. That will get the line perfect right on the, the blue tape. After we get that cut, then we will do the tipping here. Now we might not show all the details of the whole operation, but I'll start it off. I'm going to try to make this video less than an hour long. And it looks like I get get rid of my phone here. All right, we're going to do the cut now. We're going to try to cut a little bit to the right of that blue tape, and I'll grind it. So I found in the past when you go and you follow a shape like this, oftentimes this will drag here and cause a problem. So in this case here, this is that Bosch uh, cordless shear. Everybody asks about it. They're just awesome. Once you you have one, you never want to do uh, anything else but use these. <laughs> from then on. So we can watch the cut pretty nicely here. We tip this upside down. And there's our cut. And you can see there's a little bit of extra run there, and I'll grind that in. So we'll do that now. And I'll have to do the same thing on this panel also. I'll have to do the fine cut when we get to the welding on it. So I put my shield on. Norton Rolock 50 grit. These are the best. I put a little candle wax on it.
All right, the compressor kicked in a little bit, so we'll have to turn that off. But you can see that's a nice clean line now. And uh, now we're going to be ready to tip this edge. So we're going to leave that tape on there for now. We'll get this little fuzz under here. We'll have to sand that off. So I'll sand that off, and then I'm going to go over to the tipping wheel, and we're going to tip that to almost 90. All right, so now we're going to tip this line here, tip that flange up, and we'll verify on the other side and make sure we get the lines all right. So. I like to push it like this rather than having a motor. This top wheel here has a, a radius. I use this for aluminum so it doesn't bite in so hard. All right, so let's look and see what we did. Uh, I'm looking at it, and it's looking pretty good. I'll give it another run. Every time you push through, this is just a lever and fulcrum deal. This is the fulcrum, this is the lever. You supply all the power. Don't have any electricity, you still can run this machine. And you go through several passes and you keep increasing that angle. When you get it to about 30 degrees, you can slap it over with a dolly and slapper, or I have another wheel that I use and uh, that one will bring it to 90 too. I might use that tonight and show you that one. So you can see that's coming over a little bit at a time. Now, this tipping wheel deal fits right on the front of the adjuster. And I've been making these wheels for probably about 15 years now, so, or English wheels. I don't make this particular one anymore, but all of my wheels have this style adjuster in it. I'm on my about, I think, fifth or sixth iteration of how the adjuster works. I got a really slick adjuster now. And uh, with one this is where your yoke would be with this one three-quarter cap screw here. This whole deal just bolts right on and uh, the bottom deal can bolt on also on all my wheels. So you can turn them into a tipping wheel if you want. Now you see we're hitting a limitation here is that if you go up so far it'll start to hit this. On well, my other tipping wheel I, uh, I've got a different setup. It's similar but the, the, the shafts are, are beefier and it's, it's can't leave it out further. But that's really easy to tip up with a slapper now and uh, there's our measurement. There's where we want to be right on the edge of that that tape and we're looking really good there. So I haven't done this before so I'll show you this tonight. We'll take and take this bottom wheel off and we'll put the other wheel on which allows you to go to 90 degrees. And this is these are just urethane wheels, nothing special about them. They're an industrial product. You just got to find a source for them. I think a lot of these I got on eBay. eBay or uh, yard sale or flea market finds or something. So these collars adjust the position of the shaft. So I'm, I'm using this um, V groove here and I got to get that centered right over that V groove. 
and that's a 60 degree groove but it'll make a 90 degree tip because it gives it a nice little squeeze with its uh, rubber characteristic and on the the first tipping wheel you don't keep adjusting this down into the groove but this case you have to keep adjusting it you have to keep adjusting it plus lift it up and it, it'll go to the 90 degrees real easy and this hasn't been annealed that's this is the super stiff aluminum it'll go up pretty easy if you go off the line you can re-steer it a little bit and you can adjust where you were it's not a big deal now some people might say well why don't you just put that in the brake well this line isn't dead straight it kind of makes a little bit of a turn and uh, if you put it in the brake you wouldn't be accurate to the what needs to happen with the fender bolts up to it this one has a subtle little turn in I believe at one of the ends I can't remember which end the front panel had much uh, more pronounced curve in it so this is yeah this is really subtle I think it goes about that far dead straight and then this curves in about an eighth of an inch or so I'll so give it a little one more turn and one more through should be enough just about 90 degrees it actually goes more than 90 but we'll do that later yeah that's good enough leave it just like that so you can see that did a beautiful tip there's the edge this was all um, dictated by the flexible shape pattern where that position had to be so let's go marry it up with the other panel now and now remember this was all made with nothing more than flexible shape patterns and some cardboard gauges there's no buck involved here and well people say well why didn't you make a buck well I'm only making this one and I'm just showing you that the flexible shape pattern can do super accurate work um, if you're doing one offs if you're going to be doing more than one or something yeah make the buck so now what we got to do is this one hasn't been trimmed we're going to trim that up and these are going to get that joint engineered so it fits up really tight the tighter the joint the better the weld um, it's worth the time to spend to get that joint perfect uh, if you don't it's not a disaster uh, most of my welding will well I would say more accurate statement would be all of my welding is going to be uh, TIG welding versus gas welding um, I'm not a really good gas welder but I could do a pretty decent job on this I've mentioned before the, the guys that are really proficient at gas welding can weld this stuff a lot faster but most of my students that uh, come to my classes um, I don't believe they're going to learn gas welding that fast they can learn TIG welding really fast so I push the TIG welding at the classes if somebody wants to gas weld we have all the equipment you can try it but I haven't had one student uh, show me uh, excellent work with gas welding so I really don't push it so uh, gas welding uh, might be a little more forgiving with a gap but TIG welding uh, you really want to get that joint really nice and tight uh, if you can't get you have a situation where you can't get a tight joint if you clamp copper behind it and that was something I, I started years ago when I first started welding aluminum I would use copper on it but one of my students that actually convinced me that copper wasn't needed and uh, you can do a pretty decent job without the copper but if you've got a wide gap and you try to TIG weld it without any back protection 
you're going to have a lot of difficulty. So if you do have a gap, you put a little uh, piece of copper in it. It's roofing copper. It's like 21,000 thick. Um, and that makes the job really easy. So we're going to cut this uh, off camera and we'll grind it. And we'll get this all fit up. And then we'll clamp it up. And then we'll tack it up. And uh, we'll go from there. But it, the panel's looking pretty nice. The light line's showing pretty good. Um, it'll still need to be trimmed here, trimmed here, and trimmed here. But that all is all done in sequence. The next sequence on this build will be the same two panels on the other side have to be built first. I started on them. Those will be done off camera because it's just a duplicate of this. And uh, we're going to try to put the louvers in at one, some, one point. Once we get the louver, uh, the 8 inch louver die uh, fine tuned, and we're, we're confident we're going to put the, the louvers in here. So the sequence will be uh, once I get the, the, uh, the pair of these done, this is the right hand side, I get the left hand assembly done. Then this will get trimmed here, and the center section will get welded to this, and then trimmed on the other side, and the left section will get uh, welded to it. Then we'll have that whole top assembly, except for the front nose piece. And lastly, that will all get trimmed as a, 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 an assembly, and then welded right here. I did, uh, off camera, tune this step up a little this joggle a little bit. I annealed it and uh, I had to tighten up the the gap. I had it a little wide there so I tightened that up a little bit and it's easier to do now than at before, before it's welded so that needs to be ground and cleaned up and trimmed a little bit here. That, ha that can be done later. And, and these flanges will eventually go in to about 80 degrees, I believe, or 75 degrees or something like that. That's where the fender bolts up. So once we get this top section all done, hopefully it'll be done soon. Been very busy. I had my 10-week hiatus with the bronchitis, and uh, but now I've been really busy. So I'm hoping to get this thing, uh, the top piece at least, finished and then we'll do the two fenders. The two fenders are pretty easy to do. I've done those before and uh, then there's the lower section and then we can assemble the whole thing all up and hopefully we'll have the louvers in at that point too. So off camera right now I'm going to trim this just a repeat of what I did on this panel and we'll get the fine fit up and uh, then we'll, we'll bring it over to the welding department and we'll start welding it over there. So that'll be in a few minutes. Okay, here we are. We're at the welding station. I've got my Everlast uh, welder with uh, pulse on it. We're doing uh, pulse tacking and pulse welding. And uh, I've got it all clamped up nice here. Got some blankets here acting as like a third hand. A lot of times uh, getting these things clamped up is a real pain. So I usually start in the center of the panel here. I've got the panel uh, the joint really engineered nicely. I have uh, uh, all the, the grinding fuzz and everything uh, cleaned up and then I wire brushed it with a stainless steel brush and uh, the joint's looking really good. It's a little open here but that's going to close and the, f the flow is looking good. So we're about ready to start. I've got uh, 73 amps and uh, get my gloves. I like these Harbor Freight gloves. They're only 10 bucks. They're an excellent buy. And I usually use a regular non-automatic helmet. But I don't know, about three, two or three months ago, uh, Bill Longyard, the author, has done about three r really good books on uh, metal shaping. If you haven't uh, bought one, uh, check those out. They're on Amazon. William Longyard is the author. Uh, he's building a uh, a 166 Ferrari at his home shop and uh, he's taken my class a bunch of times and periodically I talk to him and he's actually the one that got me started on videos about three years ago and he's got a video channel and I've got a few videos over there I've copied them over to my channel uh, and 
he, I, I talked to him or he, he called me or I called him. I think I called him and I gave him some tips on aluminum welding with the TIG. He tried gas and really didn't like it. So he went with the, the TIG uh, uh, option and he wasn't having the results that he really liked. And I called him and I told him what's been happening in the class because I have these students coming in and they always give me a little bit of information here and a little bit of information plus my own experience and I kind of condense it and I come up with a really good solution and it's a moving target. No matter what I do it always seems to evolve and hopefully to the better all the time. So you know two years from now I might have another video on welding and I might say something totally different but uh, right now the welding is doing really well. We're using this Everlast with Pulse, and we've converted to a 50-50 mix of 50% uh, argon and 50% uh, helium. All TIG welding originally was done, it was called Heliac, and uh, the argon is a lot cheaper, works really good. You can do it with just the argon. The helium is very good for adding a little heat to the, to the equation and aluminum likes heat because it conducts it away so fast and uh, during the class I would always do these little uh, tests where I'd weld the two pieces of 060 aluminum together with the TIG welder prior to the pulse prior to the argon helium mix and uh, in ten times I could weld them together looks perfect pounded them out, sanded them or ground them so it, 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 it totally invisible on both sides and then I'd go over to the beta bag and hit it with a, a ball peen mallet at right where the weld seam was and seven times out of ten the weld was as strong as the parent metal and I couldn't figure out why the three times it would break it that uh, sort of an embarrassment especially I had 10 students around me I'm trying to show them how to do welding aluminum and then it broke uh, that's an extreme example of uh, testing but now with the addition of the helium 50-50 mix argon helium and the addition of mastering the the pulse potential uh, a 10 for 10 I'm confident that I could get uh, a situation where you, the metal is as strong as the parent metal, the joint. So, um, much less problem with the, the failure. So, anyways, I, I called Bill up and and I uh, told him about those things, and uh, it really improved his, his his welding quite a bit. And about a week went by or so, UPS came, and I, I was wondering what's UPS doing here. I didn't order anything and I open it up and it's got a nice uh, thank you card and Bill gifted me this beautiful Optrell helmet from Switzerland and it's uh, one of the state-of-the-art helmets. It, it uh, gives you a view that's all like natural. There's no coloration or anything. It looks exactly what you're looking at when you're when doing it with no lens at all. And it's automatic. It's got tons of adjustments. I do put my two and a half magnification in it and I can't thank Bill enough for gifting me this uh, helmet. It's a great addition and that's all I use exclusively now. Uh, when I'm MIG welding I, I, I use a cheaper one because I don't like to get the spatter on it but uh, it's a beautiful helmet. So if you're in the market for a helmet check out these Optrell helmets. They're expensive but they're well worth it. It's a, as Bill said it's a game changer. It really is. So remember to uh, check out his books on Amazon, William Longyard. So here we go, we're going to uh, tack this up. I usually have a little opening here, a couple inches or so. You want to be flush. I'm up a little high on this. I could probably tap it down. It's not that big a deal. Um, if it was up any more, I would. Positioning of the clamps can have an effect on that. So I'm going to put two or three tacks and then I move my cl clamps out and then just keep following it along. And this should go pretty good. Usually the first weld is always a little troublesome. You got to get enough heat into the panel. Um, typically you can kind of wander around a little bit and build up a little heat and then get to your, your seam and then give it a little blast on your pedal. So let's see what happens. Now you could do uh, a pulse uh, uh, a fusion weld here but I'll probably add a little rod.
So that was nice and tight. It uh, worked really well. I got a little bit of heat and then the second one should be easier. That's good. And remember these tacks really don't do too much. You're just relying on the tacks to kind of hold everything together and then you're going to melt it all in. So we got two heavy proud tacks there. I probably up the amperage just a little bit. It's 060 so and usually when you use pulse you, you can use a little more amperage. So let me bump it up 10 amps to 83. We're nice and tight and with flush both sides here. You can give it a little scratch. I usually put the tacks about a half an inch apart. That's better. I'll move this out a little more. Once we get attacked, it's uh, going to be pretty stable. Right now, it's pretty unstable. I have this uh, original Lotus uh, nose piece that's all smashed up in the back of the shop there belongs to one of my extended learning students and that was built by uh, Pritchards and Williams for Lotus. Uh, they built all the aluminum bodies for Lotus and the gas wells on that uh, I, I just can't believe that you could do better than that. They're just so uh, perfect and uh, they probably did them in pretty quick time too. So I'm sure that uh, Colin Chapman didn't pay too much for those bodies. need a good assortment of clamps and uh, I've been collecting my vice grips over the years. I have all these different uh, types. I have them on my vice, vice grip tree. There's quite a few of them and one day Harvey was here, my extended learning student, building the Lotus body and uh, he counted my vice grips and he, I had I think it was 323 vice grips that was just on the tree. I've got a lot of them on cars in the, in the shop. So I guess I'm a little obsessive about clamps. And for the uh, tungsten, I use uh, a 3 32nds diameter, 2% lanthanated. I was a 2% uh, thorated advocate before, and then I tried the lanthanated. Uh, I'm sure some of my students told me, but I was a little stubborn and didn't, didn't adopt it right away. But finally I tried it, and uh, it's a game changer too. It keeps a perfect size little 
sphere on the end. It doesn't grow, it doesn't wander, and uh, it serves you very well. So I'm totally lanthanated now. And I also changed my uh, gas lens to the larger format. It's a number 10. Probably uses an excessive amount of gas, but um, I don't think it's hurting to put too much gas in. Now that's a case I bumped it a couple times. I got into the pool. You see the black uh, smoke here. You can get away with it unless you dwell in there too long. So I was lucky. We'll come up the hill a little bit. I'm a little off alignment right here. I might have to go get a hammer. Let me go get a hammer. It was right here. It needs a uh, one of my body hammers that has a round face on it like this in one direction, not a uh, convex face, but a radius face like this. So I'll get one and put a dolly under there and get that straightened out. This is all good over here. So let me go get the hammer and dolly. I'll be right back. Okay, so now we're trying to just knock this down a little bit. I got this radius hammer. I got a dolly underneath there. Let's see if we can... Get that to go down a little bit. That, that did it. I'm going to move this clamp in here. Now, I was hoping to get this whole video done tonight where we get all tacked up and welded and everything but uh, it could be too much time for finishing it tonight so we might have to go into uh, 10D but it should be a pretty quick video to just do the welding but I don't want to it's Mark's here and he's in overtime and it's uh, like 11:30 p.m. right now so we can't stay all night long making the video so we're gonna get this tacked up Now my hat's off to anybody that's doing video content on YouTube by themselves. Uh, it's very difficult to do by yourself, so that's, it's a real help to have Mark helping me out here. There's just so much to do. So that's coming together pretty sweet. My uh, line is dead straight. There, that's my index line. That thing is about 12 inches long or so and it's dead straight. That's the way it was planned on the flexible shape pattern that gets you all indexed properly creates both the joint and the index so the flexible shape pattern does so much there's like uh, ten different aspects to the potential of the flexible shape pattern oh man that was a goof I stuck the rod in inadvertently. It's 11.30, I'm tired. So I'll show you what happens. When you do that, it sometimes becomes very difficult to get that spot to weld right. It looks like I got a little bit of snot on here. So I'm gonna grind it up. And I'll show you what I do. I'm going to grind this 
And I'll show you the way I uh, grind the tungsten. Yeah, so to grind the tungsten, I use these fingers here. That's my rotator fingers. Just rotate the tungsten. I'm using the core stone. I have a fine stone, a core stone here. I'm going to hold it up to this. I'm going to clean the dust off here so I can see it good. I got the light. Hold it up to the wheel. And the thumb is the guide. And there's the angle you want. We got a little cool bucket there. I make a super sharp point on it. I've tried all different things. I like that sharp point on these lanthanated. There's the blue, 330 seconds. We'll put it back in the collet and we'll burn it in. Now I'm sure any gas welder that's really good is probably snickering at me saying, ha, I would have had that thing welded about a half an hour ago. Well, that's great. But, uh, you know, I cater to people that work out of one or two car garages oftentimes and uh, for them to develop the skills that you've developed uh, is not realistic. It's uh, my same argument for the power hammer versus the English wheel. When you're in a, a smaller situation, two car garage, it's not possible to have that power hammer. So I think the TIG used to be uh, a problem because they were so expensive but the price has gone down so much that now it's accessible and there's nothing dangerous about it. If you have a settling set up in your two car garage your wife is going to be worried about that leaking all the time. That said you should really have a, a welding torch in your shop because you really need one for, for loosening bolts and stuff and bending things. So I'm going to burn this uh, tungsten in and that'll create the little ball. It only takes a minute or so. That's a uh, scrap piece of metal that I use just for getting that cleaned up and ready to go. So, back over here. I better make another big mess. What's going on here? I don't think I got any aluminum on it. Maybe I did. I don't know. Let's see. Seems to be okay. Move the clamp. Check that out, that's good. And a big part of welding is being comfortable. Obviously, I'm not too comfortable right here. So, fighting that. And I've probably mentioned it before. No matter how good a welder you are, gas or a TIG, some days it's just not your day. But you have to learn how to correct. You're always going to make mistakes, so you've got to learn how to correct. Everything's good here. These are a little snotty, but uh, not a problem that'll all melt into the mix. We'll have to clean them up a little bit with a little grinding after. 
We'll show you that in the next video, how to properly grind it. I've never tried it, but I always thought that if you took a little torch and kind of just heated it up before you did your, your tacks, it would go a lot easier. A little heat would help out a lot. All right, so that's looking really good right there. I think I can throw that one in. It's dropped down a little bit. I think I'm gonna. It needs to tighten up here. Let me get a board under that one second. Now this is the critical point here is this flange that adds all the strength to it. It looks like I'm going to have to sh uh, after I'm going to shrink this to make it go up a little bit. Well, let me see. That radius came. Look how nice that radius came together. Again, that was all plotted with a flexible shape pad. That looks good. So you're hitting the flange. Huh? You're gonna do that right now. What? The flange. Yeah, I gotta hit that down a little bit right there. All right, coming around. Now I start welding this flange now. We got that tacked. Now let's see if we can bring this up a little bit. We're going to need a support here. Because that flange makes this panel happen. That gives the panel all the strength. So let's see if we can maybe, yeah, just like that. That looks good. Now in a situation like this, if you weld from here to here, by the time you get here, it's going to be really hot. And it's going to tend to uh, melt off there. So what I generally do is try to just get a little daub on the end there. And that's flush, so we're good. Yeah, there's my daub, so that'll hold it. Let that cool down a little bit. Get the brush. Now, 
welded that up solid. It'll have to be welded on the other side, but that added a lot of strength to it. And if you can see, I'm a little bit off here. They're coming in just a tiny bit. I'm gonna have to shrink that and that'll straighten that all out. This is a super minor detail. But overall, the, uh, the panel's looking pretty nice. A few little spots uh, gotta be cleaned up with a little shrinking and a little overdevelopment, a little underdevelopment, which is the case on every panel you do. Anybody that says they make a perfect panel isn't telling the truth. There's no such thing. You can make a perfect panel, but you gotta work it. Right out of the box, they're not gonna be perfect. Mark just tried to add a little gas to the situation. <laughs> now this is going to be trimmed off here, but I'm going to weld it up anyway. Okay, so there you have it all tacked up. Some of the tacks came through, some of them didn't. These are the, the solid welds. That, uh, that's at uh, 70 or 84 amps. I'm gonna cut the amperage down a little bit. We'll just make a little run here to see, see what it'll look like. We're not gonna finish it tonight, but you can see the magic of putting two panels together and. All of a sudden, it's starting to see, show what you want to see, you know. So we'll bring it down to 62. We'll come down a little bit and see what that does. So I'm just going to weld a little bit of it here. See if I got my amperage set right. So let's see. Typically, I'd go all the way over, but I'm going to start right here and then just go over to here. So you see that with the pulse, you get a really small uh, bead. Let's see what we did with that heat. We got pretty good penetration. That will have to be run. Let me just run that and I'll show you what that looks like. So there's the backside weld, very nice. Front side weld's a little positive. I find that if you do fusion welds, uh, they look really sweet, but uh, 
you'll end up with some divots here and there and I like n no divots at all so uh, I'll have to do a little grinding but grinding doesn't scare me we'll planish that out so the next video we'll finish doing the welding and do all the grinding and planishing and everything and this will be an assembly and hopefully I can get some time together and make the other side of this so then the next the videos will be the assembly videos, a lot more welding. Welding is the, the big bugaboo in aluminum work. A lot of people shy away from doing aluminum work because they're afraid to do the welding. They know the gas welding is a, a long, steep learning curve. Um, before it used to be a price inhibitor for buying a TIG welder, that's gone and then uh, they see that oh TIG welding's no good because it cracks all the time and all that stuff and it will crack if you don't do it proper but if you get the right welder and they're not expensive today uh, you can get really really good results it's as strong as the parent metal and you get more comfortable when you're welding on, on camera it's not that comfortable believe me because you're thinking of all what you're going to say and everything so I would do this a lot faster if I wasn't on camera so I also uh, be closing tonight I want to thank everybody that's a new uh, member of subscribe to my YouTube channel there's been a big uh, boom in the subscription rates and viewership and everything and it seems like my channel is going to be growing at a much faster rate now hopefully I can do more videos and that'll grow even better and uh, I just want to thank all those people that stuck by me and the new people that came in and uh, we've got a whole bunch of videos planned we've got a lot of good stuff to, to show you uh, a lot of projects and uh, we're having fun and learning at the same time even when I do these videos I learn so uh, keep the comments coming and uh, the positive uh, likes and, and positive feedback some negative feedback if you feel compelled it's okay uh, but uh, thanks again it's Ray from Pro Shaper see you soon